Yeah, so some weeks we uh, we struggle a little bit to find enough uh, items for the news, interesting things to talk about. This was not one of those weeks. Plenty, plen- too many things to talk about, actually. Let's dive right into it. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm John. That's Josh over there. That's Dave over there. Hello. That's your cue to say hi. Oh, there, hi. There you yeah. go. Exactly. Let's jump right into it. Uh, President uh, Polish President Andrzej Duda was in Washington this week to talk to the Americans about establishing a forward military operations base here in Poland, even offering to pay for it, and, best of all, offering to call it <laughs> Fort Trump. Oh, yeah. Fort Trump. Okay, guys, what do we think about uh, going to Washington, offering to pay the Americans to establish a military base here and calling it Fort Trump? Mr. Duda goes to Washington. Yeah, yeah, it's all fascinating stuff. It follows on nicely from what we were talking about a few weeks ago, doesn't it? As if whether the Americans should even be here and will it act as a provocation to the Russians who may then beef up their defensive operations in Belarus, for example. Lots of layers to this. Yes, yes. Dave? Well, uh, it was interesting to see, uh, obviously uh, it was funny to see the naked attempt to uh, assuage, uh, to uh, massage the Donald's ego by calling it for Trump, uh, pretty transparent but possibly effective uh, yeah, tactic. This is guy who, you know, there's, there's Trump hotels and Trump Tower and there's Trump ice water, actually. He puts his name on everything, so why wouldn't he be uh, flattered by you know such an offer? Maybe it's not big enough or magnificent enough. I don't know. Fantastic. Has somebody explained the concept of a presidential library to him yet? <laughs> <laughs> it's it been an interesting conversation. Uh, yeah, but it was interesting to see the, the response from, uh, I forget his name now, it's, they, they rolled out the head of the US military. To oh, Mattis, this. wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Mattis. And uh, he gave quite a detailed response. And... Um, Reading between the lines, I think he was kind of saying, are you sure you want this? Because they're enormous, our bases. You know, he's talking uh, tank ranges, um, you know, obviously rifle ranges. There's a huge you infrastructure. You need a lot of space, a lot of infrastructure. So even I, who am in favor of this base, and I uh, was glad to hear how awesome it would be if it was built, uh, you know, state-of-the-art missiles have to be uh, housed somewhere on the European continent. Uh, Interestingly, nobody, neither side is talking about definitive It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. This dance has been going on for, what, 10 years now? You know, Bush agreed to build the, the missile defense shield in Poland. Obama pulled it back. They're always going to be, you know, wary of doing Dave, this. You said before, when we, we, we talked about the subject before, and you said that uh, the, the Americans like to kind of leave it, leave it hanging there as a way to keep the Russians guessing as to what uh, mm-hmm. the strategic uh, objectives are for the Americans in this part of the world. It does absolutely no harm for the Polish government to ask for it. I, you know, I think we, you know we've we've spoken about this a few times. Uh, I just uh, I'd be very skeptical of unless a certain uh, bequeathed U.S. president gets a little uh, vanity project going here. I, I, I honestly don't think there's any huge intention from either side. Oh, wait, what to, do you? Th- uh, I have to ask you guys, as as good and enthusiastic European citizens, uh, what do you think about an EU member going to a? F- uh, a country outside of Europe, albeit a friendly country, and saying, hey, why don't you guys come to our country, set up a forward operating position, a defensive uh, a military you know, installation in our country, we'll pay for it, and yeah, maybe we'll talk to our European allies later. Does this make any sense to you? Yes, it does. It's a ringing endorsement for the uh, European Union's armed forces um, <laughs> exactly. collective might. Uh, well, well uh, there's an element... Brussels have some kind of army or something? <laughs> there's an element of the Polish government trying to show that they have uh, friends in high places, so to speak, uh, you know, to uh, you know that the EU is not the only game in town, and they're Brussels... not being—they're uh, not in their perception being very nice to Poland at the moment. So Poland's trying to say, you know, we have other options. What should Suppose. Brussels' reaction to this be? These these high-level conversations, these offers for Fort Trump. Well, I mean, I don't think they. Uh, I think they've enough on their plate with Brexit at the moment. To be honest, which I don't think they're too worried about this. <laughs> Yeah, especially <clears throat> quiet from what I've seen. I didn't see any official yeah. comment, really. So, oh yeah, well, like Dave says, it's all Brexit at the moment, and they obviously can't, you know, concentrate on more than one thing at the same time. They're busy, I guess. <laughs> one interesting side story that came out of this visit to Washington that's become a, a big story in itself, I guess you could say, is a is a photograph. I imagine everybody's seen this photograph by now of uh, of uh, President Andre Duda standing and uh, at the Trump's White House, uh, de- I should say, Oval Office desk. Signing something and Trump looking like uh, he, he looks like he's just been told the lunch buffet is closed. <laughs> 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 Not happy at all. Uh, and uh, what it, this? There's something weird about this picture. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something odd about this picture. How, how did how did this happen? 
how did it happen is the question. Like, you know, it's so weird. One of them standing up, leaning across, Donald sitting down, you know, I mean... There's no don't extra they have, chair in the Oval Office? Don't they have staffers to coordinate this stuff, you know, like well, professional also, I mean, it photographers was presum- as well? I was going to say, it was presumably a photographer who took the photograph because that's how photogra- photographs get taken. Good point. And um, there's a likelihood that the photographer took huge numbers of photographs and someone made an editorial decision that that one, yeah. that particular facial expression and that particular yeah, relationship exactly. to people is the one that uh, is deserving of being splashed across the world's media. But you don't think someone's being uh, naughtily uh, manipulating the optics, Joshua? Well, no, but it happens all the time, doesn't it? I mean, you know... You know what's weird about this is that, first of all, they're in the Oval Office. This is not the place where agreements... And by the way, we don't know what agreement was signed. We don't know what's on the paper, really. But they do this, and there are other rooms for this, and there are other... There are other, you know, settings for this, visual settings. They don't do this in the Oval Office. Secondly, on both sides, the American side and the Polish side, there are uh, protocol officers that plan every move they make, every yeah. handshake, every gesture, every, you know, your turn to talk, your turn to talk. So how it happened that the guy is left standing and didn't want to be standing, which is the implication of the picture that Trump was somehow being rude by not offering, offering him a, a, a chair... I just don't see how that happens. Some, something's fishy about this picture, mm-hmm. even though I'm, I'm not suggesting it's doctored. It really happened, but I, I seem, there's something missing from the backstory. No? Yeah, yeah, perhaps Duda just let one go. And... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, moving on. Let's talk about Viswa Krakow. You know, we, what was it, a month or so ago, we talked about uh, the history of some of the, the, not some of the Krakow clubs, both Krakow clubs. Uh, Viso Krakow's back in the news, as usual, for the wrong reasons. Some seriously shady dunes are transpiring. Teva Win, the uh, television network, broadcast uh, an investigative report that removed any lingering doubt anyone may have had about the very real connections between Viso Krakow, the organization, and their, let's say, their... uh, well, their, their hooligan element, basically, the hooligan element of their their fan base has very real uh, uh, financial connections to the club, organizational connections to the club. Again, no doubt whatsoever. And the evidence is so clear and compelling, so damning that the club basically went into uh, radio silence for four or five days after the uh, report was broadcast refusing to contact the media. Uh, just a couple of days ago, the uh, the club president, Marjana Sarapata, who I'll we'll return to in just a moment, uh, she surfaced to say that uh, everything in the report is false and everything's fine and we deny everything and no questions, goodbye. And uh, the, the immediate fallout from this includes the fact that an association of journalists from all over the country they boycotting. that cover the club, they're, they're refusing to cover the club, refusing to kind of, you know, give them publicity and... Uh, I guess, uh, you know, include stories about Viswa in their newspapers. Uh, even their main sponsor, LV Bet, which is an online casino, uh, online uh, sports betting, I should say, uh, they're demanding answers and claiming that if these accusations are true, it could be a basis for breaking the contract. So this might be about to blow up even bigger. Uh, are we shocked and appalled by uh, the, the reality of uh, dodgy links between football clubs and fans? Well, it was. I read the story with great interest. Uh, it was a it was a juicy investigation. But uh, congratulations to the reporters of TVN. But it is something we've seen before. You know, the ultra groups warming their way into the to the cl- club structures. Uh, basically, there's a bit of a quid pro quo that goes on, isn't there? It's kind of like you want us to behave. Well, there's certain things we want, and I imagine there's a usually a, a ticket scam going on with the ultras you know they buy up blocks of season tickets and rent them out for the to the highest bidder and take all the all the profit and numerous other things that go on all over the country like Italy which has a big issue with this you know the municipal stadiums all over the place uh, this is the situation with the Krakow stadium they don't own the ground so unlike Krakowia's ground where they can have a, a really strict uh, ID they have a ID policy in Krakowia I don't see that uh power being there for the uh, visa authorities. Josh, what do you know about uh, similar history, either present or past, with some English football clubs? Not very much, actually, which is not a helpful answer. Um, I mean, you know, the golden age, if that's the right term, of of, of British football hooliganism was the 80s, um, where even I was a bit on the young side to, you know know too much about that um identification cards for for season ticket holders were brought in for many many years you could and legitimately if you couldn't attend a game for some reason you could 
someone else could use your season ticket to get in. Even at that time in the 80s, with the hooligans making this trouble at this, you know, at matches and whatnot. It's different in England, though. But, but wait, but wait, did, did they have access to the front office of the club? Were they involved in financial decisions? No. Were they, were no, they using no. a club no. space for other activities? No, I was, comparing, like I was comparing it to the Italian situation. Like, there's a lot of uh, famous instances of uh, ultras infiltrating uh, clubs in this way. Uh, famously, Juventus uh, in 2007 or eight, they moved stadiums. So they're going from the municipal monstrosity on the edge of town into their bright new shiny ground in the centre of the city. And to keep the ultras from uh, ruining it, uh, they uh, did a deal where they sold through a ticketing agency blocks of hundreds of tickets to the head of each one of the little firms. And they made a huge profit then reselling the tickets. But in England, the clubs owned their own stadiums. And post-Taylor Report, which was the uh, after the Hillsborough disaster, every club had to go all-seater. So every club in the country was required to drastically upgrade the stadium. And they all did that with their own money. You know, I mean, there are no municipal grounds. West Ham, I suppose, is the only example they could think <laughs> yeah, of yeah. Uh, in the Premier League. And that's the huge difference. Uh, it's the business model of the, of the football clubs and the stadiums that's uh, made the gap. Because if you don't own the stadium, you don't have full control over it. And it's very easy for these fan groups if they press the right uh, levers and buttons. And I thought it was interesting as well in the article how they founded the the fighting uh, the the fighting club, the I assume martial arts, martial arts, arts kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, in in the property of the club, which is a part of their athletic association. Exactly, it's not just a football and the, club. And the, they got some really sweetheart deal on the rent. They pay like well below market rates to rent mm, the which space. Which is one of the things they get back for not uh, you know going crazy inside the stadium on a weekly basis. Just, I suppose. Just one more question about what do you think in in this take the English league for example the Premier League, uh, not from the financial perspective but from the cultural perspective. Can you imagine? I mean, is it even possible that this uh, you know really nasty criminal element of the fan base? approaches the club today and demands to have some kind of special access or privileges. Hooliganism was... Do you think they would get it? Hooliganism, the stadiums are the key thing. It was designed out of the game. You just couldn't do it anymore because in a British stadium, you were constantly under surveillance. You were on camera. If you run onto the pitch, you lose your season ticket. If you assault somebody, you lose your season ticket, you will go to prison. Too much Uh, to lose. You know, and it was the hooligan movement in England in the 80s was massive. You're talking about gangs of 10,000 people uh, traveling up and down the country, beating the living shit out of each other. You know, it was chaos every Saturday. I mean, it was a huge problem, but it just it didn't seep into the structures of the clubs in the same way. They weren't as complicit as it seems um, the, the visa are. Just to give you an idea of how deep the tentacles appear to, to reach down into the organization, let's rewind back to 1999. Uh, Viso Krakow was involved in a European competition, not sure which one, but Parma, the Italian club Parma was here in town. Is this the Dino Baggio incident? And Dino Baggio was struck in the head by a knife, a pocket knife that was thrown from the crowd. Uh, The guy who threw it was identified and he's uh, as a member of the uh, the hooligan element of the Viso fan base, sent to prison for six years. The lawyer who represented him, again, a convicted uh, hooligan convicted of, uh, of assault, aggravated assault. Uh, the lawyer who represented him was none other than Marjana Sarapata, the same Marjana Sarapata who is the president of the football club today. Uh-huh. So when she sits there at the press conference as she did yesterday and claims to have no idea how anybody could get these crazy ideas about a hooligan association with the club, it rings a little bit hollow, I, I guess you could say. Yeah. So, Well, keep an eye on this. Uh, very interesting, interesting developments and going Just forward. Just to say, it is a it is a disgraceful state of affairs. Like it really was, and if they ever want to fill that stadium and uh, you know get a, a kind of fan friendly atmosphere, it's a it's a terrible way but to just go. Quick, about. Wait, just quickly though, are the, you think they're being picked on? Couldn't you take any random, reasonably big Polish football club and find the same kind of uh, you know associations if you dig deep enough? Well, that will be interesting to see. I think so. Legia Warszawa, Szlansk Wrocław, Rukorzów, Lech Poznań. Yeah. Lech Poznań. There are a lot of clubs that have these kind of you know uh, issues to deal with. And yeah, I suppose the reason I used uh, Juventus as a comparative example was it's pretty much one of the biggest football clubs in the world. If it can happen there, if they can get their tentacles and their claws in there, it can kind of it can happen anywhere, I suppose. But yeah, it would be interesting to see how many of the other top Polish clubs have. Uh, shady affiliations with uh, basically mafia figures you know these guys are involved in all sorts of uh, crime in the city you know so it's uh, yeah we're not uh, just talking about the odd fist fight yes I mean, I mean these are serious hardened criminals drug dealers you know I mean it's it's pretty disgraceful uh, state of affairs and as I said again good investigation from TVM I think it's how you John wouldn't you very interesting yeah 
Moving on, uh, speaking of crime and criminals, Dave, you've got some details uh, on a proposal, just a proposal at the moment, Mm -hmm. from someone on the city council who wants to uh, eliminate crime here in Krakow. How are they going to do it? Well, I think it's a pretty interesting proposal. You know, it sounds a bit uh, Orwellian, but uh, with that objection straight out of the way, because it's uh, it's a pretty obvious place to start, uh, I would say that this system, you're selling it short a little bit in your intro, John. What does he want to do? He wants to put a button, reflector, camera, loudspeaker, microphone, and install it on every single, um, what would you call them? Uh, Street lamp. lamp Lampposts. Every single... Lamppost. 55,000... Of these 112 help systems all around the city, uh, a pilot scheme starting in the, in the very centre of the city. And the idea is, if you're, say, being attacked, robbed, uh, if you notice uh, somebody doing something suspicious, you can uh, hit the alarm um, and instantly then it goes to a control centre. It's not constantly monitored, but only when the alarm goes off, then a person in this control centre can start saying, you, you in the green hat, get away from him. <laughs> Now, I've never heard of this anywhere. I mean, this is pretty pretty kind of advanced, isn't it? You know, there's also a, a searchlight function. Like, so uh, if it's dark at night, all of a sudden you, you, you feel like you're in a spotlight. You, you can kind of see it working, could you? Maybe in, in, in my head, I see people, I see it stopping crime. I I'm, could, I'm tentatively, very tentatively going to come out and say it's an interesting idea and possibly should be piloted. I can only imagine already you hit the button in a situation of emergency and a very polite voice comes over the loudspeaker. Thank you for your alert. Unfortunately, all of our technical crew are busy, but we will get to your call in good time. Please stand by. Please stand by, yeah. Uh, what do you think, John? Civil uh, liberties? Mixed feelings on this. Uh, Freedom isn't free. Josh, you're, you're from London. London installed CCTV everywhere. And London has been completely crime-free since then, right? Absolutely, yeah. No crime <laughs> at all in the entirety of London since it the It doesn't seem to have any impact at all, at all on crime rates. I, this is very over, well, overstated no, what, what, how, what how much of a deterrent it is. Is that the, actually it coincides with the rise of the hoodie, if you're familiar with that expression, oh, right, the yeah, item yeah. of clothing which allows you to completely conceal your face. True. <clears throat> yes, but uh, just just to go back here for a second, because you made the London comparison at the at the start of your introduction to this pe- part of the show, and I already refuted it in my long response. It's not the same thing as having a constantly monitored CCTV system, which is what London has in, its, in the centre. This is basically a kind of alarm system. Right. You know, and also you could use the footage if there was, say, a serious crime, you could retrace them. So, they're also, so the they're cameras would have watching, that function Passively post-crime. watching and actively, like, when yeah. you call for help. Exactly. So it is a bit different to anything I've ever heard of before. The idea is that if it's on every street lamp, you know, you could be, you're, you're never more than 100 meters away from some kind of emergency help. Yeah. If you need it. You could kind of see the stag parties having a bit of bit of mischief with this well, okay. <laughs> and when you said yeah. you could get a spotlight put on you i mean how, how, you know get yeah. some drunk people they want to perform for an audience hell yeah. you can get you can literally get a spotlight put on you and you can just dance and sing. i mean crack up's already pretty safe this could make it like ultra safe i, I just uh, oh nicely tied in with the previous piece the ultra safe yeah. how 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 much would this cost and for what is there really a need how many people how many times do we hear of people who go through horrible things, traumatic events, you know, violence or whatever, because they didn't have a button on a street lamp that they could press. Well, if nobody's ever had the option of pressing help. this button, then how would you be able to compare it to... Uh... If, this is, if this is south side of Chicago, if this is in Rio de Janeiro in the slums, if this is in LA, okay, maybe I can see it. But here, I just how many... How many incidents are they going to be able to intervene in? Well, what about the... They otherwise uh, would not have been able to. What about the uh, freedom of personal information element of it, John? Are you offended by the, the thought of being monitored? Well, by the, I mean, uh, yeah, it's kind of, it is creeping kind of big, big brotherism, isn't it? As you walk down the street, you're just recorded everywhere you go. You've got nothing to hide, but you are uh, your movements are, rec- are tracked and recorded. Um, if you can use it to kind of stop assaults on the street, what if what if they're watching and they see somebody uh, take a piss on the street? Can they send the cops out and chase you down for that? If you spit on the street, if you litter on the street, I mean, wh- where, what's the line? What, well, I think those, those are infractions and crimes. And so if they see it being done, aren't they obligated to do something about it? I mean, I think there's particularly That's a good question. an issue of... Oh, yeah. like, oh, yeah, talking. Frivolous, frivolous abuse of it. I mean, you know, like you have... 
fire alarms in buildings are generally behind a, you have to break the glass to, you, yeah. know, you, you know setting off a fire alarm is you don't do it lightheartedly or if you do you're yeah. a bit of an idiot but if you just got like a yellow button on every street lamp and you can like kind of casually oh, oh sorry i didn't mean to press that uh, and all the lights come on a voice like no no everything's fine i'm yeah. just on my way home Could, couldn't you solve that with a simple large sign that says uh, you know um False alarms will be fined. You know, something that uh, gives a penalty for someone uh, using it incorrectly. I think, yes, exactly, which you, you have to have some kind of penalty mechanism built into the abuse of the system, yeah. Because it could lead to a flood of uh, yeah. uh, calls that could be work on, on the, civil, on the civil, civil liberties angle, I'm curious about how it might work here or how it works now in the UK. You know, you're collecting this information. It's data, basically, you're recording all this stuff. How does it work? Someone in, in London, for example, says, I'm convinced that my husband or wife is cheating on me, and this has a massive influence on a huge divorce case we're going through, and the government has these tapes that will prove my case, and I want access to those tapes. Well, you'd Can, never be allowed. You just legislate for it. You, because they've clearly said, even in the proposal, it would only be uh, in the cases of serious violent crimes that you'd be able to go back through the footage and review it. I'm a super it rich person. I'm going through a mega expensive divorce case. These tapes can, this ta- these tapes can save or cost me... Mega, mega money, uh, and I want access to them. You're going to say no? The government's going to say no? Yeah. I'm a senior government minister. My divorce is going to be very expensive. Can I have it? Oh, thank you very oh, much. Oh, exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, look, you know, any system like that would be, I suppose, open to, to some abuse. I just think it, it's kind of exaggerated in our minds, you know, uh, if there's a lot of cameras everywhere. Nobody cares what we're doing. Like, you know, it's only really to prevent the things that it's actually set up to do in a city like Krakow. Obviously, you know, if this system was put in place in North Korea, it would have a far more sinister uh, undertone. No, we have cameras you know? now and all the new trams and buses have cameras built in. Yeah, them, right? I mean, so we're watching when we get on the public yeah. transport, so yeah. who cares, right? Well, there's been, I mean, in Britain, <clears throat> in Britain, I think in the States, there's been a huge rise in CCTV porn, isn't there? You, know, from... <laughs> you want to tell us something, <laughs> Josh? Candid, <laughs> candid captures of people enjoying... Uh... All right, we'll, we'll, we'll post the link to the website, Josh's favorite <laughs> website in the show notes. Allegedly, let's let's move on. We're going to close up with a couple of random odds and ends notes uh, related to a couple of stories we mentioned lately. Very quickly, uh, we had an episode lately with our friend Dr. Mike, where he expertly uh, spoke on the subject of the mayoral uh, race. Going Bravoro on. stuff, Mike, I have to say. Good stuff, Mike. Um, yes. Just a couple of updates in the news. Uh, Wasserman, Microsoft Wasserman. Pro- he knows week, a lot of this stuff. Week, this, this actually touches on two things we talked about recently. Wasserman promised, promise, that's a quote, promised, to get Krakow a metro if elected. Uh-huh. The metro that Krakow didn't want four years ago. Guys, very quickly, uh, pie in the sky uh, promises or this is a, a good platform to run on? Well, that's the idea of an election, isn't it? You know, you put your, you put your weight behind certain uh, thoughts and um, ideas and uh, she'll be well aware, I'm sure, of the referendum result. Uh, you vote for Wasserman, still, you still will get a metro that is a promise. On the other side of the election, um, incumbent Jacek Marowski, he, he uh, last week he uh, unveiled the um, the campaign theme for this year's election. Now he's been in office for sixteen years. I find this funny. He's been in office for sixteen years. He's trying to make it twenty, uh, and his uh, campaign theme is "Together We'll Shape the Future of Krakow." <sighs> Dynamic. The guy's been in office for sixteen years, and now now he wants to shape the future of Krakow. Josh, uh, ridiculous or uh, reasonable? I think he used the wrong grammatical construction there. Maybe still trying to shape the future of <coughs> Krakow. Yeah. Give me another four years to think about maybe starting the future. But I mean, at least that's not going to come back and bite him. Whereas if Wasserman, get, if Wasserman gets in and she decides not to build a metro, then that will be true. forever. This is true. Incumbent sloganeering is uh, in, yeah. just inherently difficult. Though. I remember the Irish government's one once was, lots done, more to do. All right, okay, I'm already They probably paid some consultant five like, oh, million go euro on, for Go that on, too. you will, you will, you will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And last thing, practical note, a bit of a problem for people who live on the west side of town. Starting today, as we record this, starting today and for the next 10 months at least, the tram line going from Bagatella through Karmelitska, Krulevska, all the way to Bronovica will be closed for renovations. Uh, If you live on the west side of town, well, you have problems because that is a major traffic artery. As you know, you'll have the chance to take buses down Kazimierz of Elkiego. We, the three of us, don't... We live in the center on the east side of town. We, do we care? This is not my problem. 
I'm kind of laughing. Well, a few years ago, I, you know, uh, Mogilska and Yanapava was closed, which is a huge problem for me, but that's over now, so it's not my problem if uh, West Side people have to walk a bit more. You feel bad for them, Dave? Uh, yeah, we, went through, we went through all the closers on our roundabouts uh, a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, it's, it's your, your turn, turn It's your side. turn to be upgraded. It's wonderful when they finish it. So uh, uh, I saw that they're running two new bus lines uh, every three and then every six minutes. Uh, so that's fairly decent. Yeah, bus is constant, but it's still a bus. I, I like trams. Do you like? I don't like to ride a bus. There's no doubt the hierarchy of public transport goes bus, then tram. Yeah, both the bus yeah, is a yeah, distant yeah. second choice for me. Yeah, yeah. I get the bus though because... Uh, the, I just uh, have one that goes directly to me. I've done some analysis of the timetables. I don't think my journey to the studio will be impacted to any <laughs> to roll degree. out of bed. Yes. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. Remember, crackhouse.pl. All our contact information is there. Find us on Facebook. Give us a like. You know what to do. We'll see you next time on the Crackcast. Take care. Cheers. Yes.